my talk is designed to really help familiarize cybersecurity professionals with the cyber threat intelligence discipline. Um, by design, what we're trying to cover here should roughly take about a half hour. Now, I realize we are in a bit of a precarious position. Uh, I stand between you and a coffee break, which is probably the second worst thing from standing between you and lunch or you and a beer break. Um, now, either way, with that in mind, what I'll try and do is I'll try and keep this pretty concise. I'll keep this down to a about 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, if we can, we can entertain some questions here. Given the live stream uh, nature of this, I'm not sure that we'll be able to. However, if we can, I'm happy to accommodate. If not, I'm happy to answer questions offline. We can uh, chat on Twitter or any of the social media platforms. And hopefully at some point I'll get a chance to meet all of you in person. So we'll go ahead and we'll get started here. Um, before I get started with the presentation, just natural kind of disclaimer, all of the content presented in here is my own. It represents my own views, not that of my employer. I <clears throat> will, as you see throughout the presentation, talk about one of an in the interesting projects that I was able to create, which is a framework that Mandiant published um, that I was able to publish on behalf of Mandiant. So we'll use that as kind of a baseline to help us understand how some of the different skills play various uh, roles into connecting and helping us understand and work better together as a collective defense force in cyber security. Uh, you'll also find that about me, I tend to tell stories. So a lot of what you'll find in this presentation deck is derivative of my personality, the experiences that I've lived through, uh, the type of humor that I have, should resonate, I think, with a lot of you. So if you see some Easter eggs in here, that's cool. Uh, it's part of the whole uh, plan. It's by design. So a quick <clears throat> agenda of what we're going to cover here. I'll spend just a few minutes talking about myself, who I am, uh, how I kind of came to be in this field and what I've learned. We'll talk a little bit about the cybersecurity field, its nature, how cyber threat intelligence plays a role in it. We'll talk about the various stakeholders, so I'll spend a decent amount of time talking through what we actually do in cyber threat intelligence, because I feel like there's often a misunderstanding about that. Um, there's a lot of different roles. There's a lot of different deliverables that we end up creating, and oftentimes what I found in working with various different cybersecurity teams is they think uh, one thing and it's perhaps not representative of the whole. Uh, and then we'll talk about the framework I created, this cyber threat intelligence analyst core competencies. And what you'll see is as we get to that point, we'll be able to break down the different components, the different constituent pieces that various analysts have. Now I have some use cases that I will bring up, um, one of which is to use this to help us better collaborate as teams. Um, there are also other use cases as well, which as to use this to build roadmaps to grow your analysts workforce. Um, and then I'll give you some parting thoughts and hopefully we can get the Q&A uh, working here. But if not, again, happy to entertain those questions uh, on social media or other platforms. So who am I? I drink and I know things. Um, so I'm John Doyle. I live in Colorado. Uh, we are out here in Belgium, which is probably comparable as far as beer is concerned. So I've been in digital forensics or cyber threat intelligence for about 15 years at this point. I started out working at a computer repair shop, uh, kind of doing help desk stuff like I think a lot of us in this profession did. Um, from there, I have kind of navigated my way up and found a very niche focus. I spent 10 years working for the CIA. That was kind of interesting. I know a lot about North Korea, Russia, and various different nation state cyber actor programs. Um, what I've learned there, I'll kind of capture through some of my experiences as we talk about the framework itself, about how the profession has developed. At some point in time, I realized that I reached the senior ranks and I wasn't really doing what I intended to do when I kind of joined this profession, which was give back help broaden the community. Now I was doing some really good work helping uh, with national security interests and whatnot, but I wasn't being able to give back in an effective manner. So at that point in time, I started teaching. I started doing instruction and facilitation. 
Um, so I worked at an academic institution concurrently, and that has been gratifying for a whole host of different reasons. Here I am at Mandiant. I've served in a few different roles at this point in time. Uh, I've done the analytic thing. I understand our practices. I took kind of a out of body experience where I <clears throat> was a strategic consultant. Actually going out evaluating building solutioning. Um, various different programs that existed. Identifying areas of weakness and providing recommendations for helping programs actually grow to various states of maturity. Where I am now is actually an intelligence consultant, so it blends those two worlds together quite nicely. Often I'm asked to go out, work with clients, various cyber threat intelligence teams, or um, the SOC function or the CISOs, and help them understand where they are. Help them understand how intelligence plugs in, how they can build a capability, uplift their people, uh, design around their various mission mandates that they have in place. So a lot of what you'll see here is going to kind of come out in the form of, you know, this framework. Uh, a lot of the lessons learned take into account the various experiences and exposures that I've been able to afford. Uh, it's been quite nice. Um, I also teach for SANS. So again, kind of going along with the helping build and grow the next generation of professionals. Um, I find this work very gratifying. A good starting point, though, is to understand where we come from, right? What we all do and how that plays a role in the collective mission mandate. In cyber threat intelligence, we sometimes call this the common operating picture. The uh, common frame of reference is just another way to call this out. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is focus on one of a few different things, right? Help bolster collective defenses, whether that's prevention, detection, um, or remediation efforts, or also look at risk exposure decisions. So I like to use the OODA loop as a good exemplar to kind of talk through what that actually means. For those of you not familiar with the OODA loop, this is a construct developed by the US Air Force, a gentleman named John Boyd, and it's consistent of four different parts. The first part there, and the most important part is observe. Before making any decisions, collective defense or otherwise, you need situational awareness. You need lay of the land. Lay of the land comes from those direct observations in our environment that is looking at our logs, looking at different types of intrusion activities. Um, only then can we make effective decisions. So where I like to start the conversation out here is we all are trying to accomplish very similar things. At a high level, it all rolls up to a particular one, two, three, four different mission mandates. The OODA loop, when we're working together, we can actually run around the OODA loop a lot quicker together, a lot quicker than our adversaries who have their own OODA loops. So in a way, the collective defense mission mandate we have will allow us to find synergy find collaboration opportunities and be able to outpace adversaries. And that's where intelligence really kind of shines. There's been a few different iterations of identification of roles that exist within this field. Now, I've been in it for 15 years at this point. I've seen various jobs called out much like most of you. I think the NIST framework does a really good job identifying what those various roles are. They break them down into these various categories here. So under the NIST NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, you can see it's broken out into uh, seven different categories. And it actually breaks out the roles and functions for them into knowledge, skills, and ability competencies. SANS has taken this one step further, and they've actually listed out a mapping that roughly aligns uh, within reason of where the different roles fall. So based on those knowledge, skills, and abilities, what the different types of job roles in cybersecurity look like. When we're thinking about cyber threat intelligence, though, we have kind of a broad mission mandate. Right? Our goal at the end of the day is to be a service organization. We are here to support you. Um, so when asked, you know, 
what would you say you do here? The answer is not. I take the requirements from the client to the engineers. It's well, we work hand in glove, right? We look at threats. We understand the threats. We understand capabilities. We understand risk. We understand alignment. So when we are thinking through, you know, what does threat actually mean? The standard convention we tend to use in this field is threat is a function of three different things. Adversary intentions, their opportunity or our exposed attack surface and the capabilities. Um, so understanding adversary motivations. So here you can see I've used a very popular meme these days to kind of describe that. CTI analyst provides timely, relevant, actionable insights on threat actors, capabilities, motivations to inform risk exposure decisions and cyber defense actions. It's really important that I foot stomp that last point because sometimes it's very easy to just think of cyber threat intelligence as a function of cyber defense and not put it into the more holistic context of informing risk exposure decisions. Now, most of you are on the practitioner tactician side, either building, designing, implementing, uh, remediating. What we try and do, obviously, is you know you are the action arm or the action arm that we are supporting. The way we break that out is into three different audience types. So for us in the cyber threat intelligence profession, we're looking at three different broad categories, and you probably find yourself in one of these three, strategic, operational, or tactical. We might call you a stakeholder, we might call you a customer. All of these words mean the same thing. They're all synonymous in our parlance. This is how we communicate with ourselves. Um, when we think about this though, right, you can naturally see some alignment. One of the nice things about cyber threat intelligence is we create frameworks. Frameworks help us provide a mental model. That mental model allows us to then do things with it, whether that's helping uh, devise new solutioning, help bucket our thought process, help explain to various customers what our thoughts are. So when we're looking at strategic, operational, and tactical, chances are you fall in one of these three, right? We've created this overarching framework. Strategic level is exactly what you think. Typically, analysts who are strong on the strategic side tend to be able to understand the threat landscape. They can quickly understand how a certain event, whether it's an internal trigger or something that's externally reported, actually plays into the broader risk apparatus. How does this affect us? Does it affect us? Is this something we need to worry about? What's the priority level or prioritization we should put on it? And the typical stakeholders tend to fall across that spectrum of your C-suite executives, your risk management folk. When you get to the operational side, this is more kind of what we'd expect to see in terms of the response arm. So our SOC colleagues, our incident responders. Um, this is where we do things like tracking adversary capabilities, tracking actor intents, tracking their motivations, being able to identify the different TTPs that they're using in order to be successful in their operations across the various um, campaigns that they're undertaking. Tactical gets more to you know, our SOC support directly, creating IOCs, creating detection signatures that are going to be relevant and useful, things that we can push to our security controls. So the question begs, okay, well, tell me about, you know, a threat analyst. Tell me about a cyber threat intelligence professional. Clearly there's just one job title. No, there's, there's not. Um, hate to break that to you. When we think of the composite, when we think of the composition, there's actually a lot of titles that exist out there. And uh, based on the various titles, based on the roles and responsibilities, you'll find variants in the people who fill those. Now, this doesn't even get into the discussion about, is this a junior person? Is this a senior person? What's the variance in level of knowledge and ability? Um, instead, it is a starting point. Right? It is a starting point for a conversation. So when you are engaging with your threat analysts, cadre, when you're engaging with the various CTI cells that exist, this ends up being a point in which 
you can start to ask probing questions to understand what that level of familiarity looks like. So me personally, I work more on the operational and strategic side. Uh, I've learned myself over time. I'm actually pretty decent at explaining things and putting it into, you know, big picture. So I find myself being asked in most cases to do strategic stuff, even though my passion lies in tracking adversaries um, and trying to impose pain on them. What you will find though is based on each of these roles, there is specialization. Um, and as the field has evolved, as cybersecurity has evolved, right? Back in the day, we had information assurance, then information security, and now we have cybersecurity, right? Each of these has their own specific slant. And those slants have various <clears throat> expertise embedded inside of them that we can leverage and we can use. At the heart of it though, everything that we do on the CTI side is predicated on some baseline things. Those baseline things are what we call intelligence requirements. So you as our stakeholders provide us with a listing of use cases you say use cases, we say intelligence requirements, tomato, tomato. We take those intelligence requirements from you and the other stakeholders, and we identify and prioritize. We create a list. Um, we create how these actually fit into the grand scheme of things. We create a production matrix, right? So we are using what's called an intelligence cycle. You can see that denoted on the left here with this circular diagram. And we're using our intelligence requirements, our framework here, to understand how we can support. I won't go through the examples. I'm sure you're reading those on the screen. But you can see things like understanding adversary TTPs that are targeting us, that are targeting our industry pairs. That is a high priority. We want to know that from a strategic level. We also want to know that from a tactical level to ensure that we have detections in place to ensure that we're actually tracking these groups such that when a breach does happen, we are prepared for it, such that we are investing our resources in a way that is effective and makes the most sense for the organization. One of the things I find a lot of our peers in the various cybersecurity disciplines don't understand what we do is this. We actually have listings of tools and data sets that we use broken down. So it's not just a full enumeration of fields, right? I know you can get that from a SIM. What we actually do here though is we rack and stack. We keep a listing of our tallies, we keep a listing of our tools, we keep a listing of our data sets and what benefit they provide us. Now we call this a collection management framework. Sometimes it's referred to as a collection plan. I've seen this broken out into a few different ways. This first one you can see at the top of your screen here tends to be a kind of generic one like let me just do an x y access let me list out the tools let me enumerate all the things we get and then i can make a cost comparison or i could do gap analysis it's helpful right? this is for external tool sets as you can see you could do this with internal data sets as well um, where i find the most utility in creating something like a collection plan though is this bottom left actually aligning you know, various tools, various uh, vendor feeds and stuff to the intelligence requirements at hand, and then doing a prioritization, whether it's low, medium, high, um, confidence level, certain percentage, et cetera. Um, that tends to be where a lot of organizations tend to get the most bang for their buck, at least on the CTI side, when they're trying to do metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of, the, of what they're paying for, of where their finite resources are actually going. And in some cases, you can see, like on the right-hand side, if you are looking at various um, groups, if that is an intelligence requirement, you can go even more granular. Let me look specifically at the groups. In this particular case, you know, I care a lot about Russian sets. Um, so I've enumerated all the Russian sets. I've enumerated all of the various vendors that we use to be able to get a more deliberate view of the threat picture from these groups and you know I just did a binary yes no so there's a lot of different ways in which collection plans can be created however what I've noted and this is again I'm going to foot stomp this point because I was working with a client recently and like 
We brought their IR team in, we brought their SOC in, we brought their CTI team in. They had no idea we kept this information. They had no idea that we keep, keep this type of a framework. Because it's particularly useful, especially when we're thinking about resource decisions, making joint justification for buying licenses for various tools um, or various vendor feeds. Right? We can make a more compelling use case when we actually have it enumerated. Um, this is a function that CTI as a cell is responsible for doing. All right, so let's actually talk about what we do. Right? Those were some kind of high level cyber threat intelligence stuffs. So, uh, you know, on the left hand side, the kind of the profession has grown from either two different tracks. It's either grown from traditional intelligence analysis, whether it's military analysis, economic analysis, um, looking at different signals intelligence, things of that nature, or cybersecurity professionals. Now on the left here, when you're thinking about the intelligence track, right, they tend to be generalists, right? They are the Jack Ryan. They think they, um, they have the ability to take in a lot of information, have really good working memory and really good recall, be able to present that in a way that's meaningful to their stakeholders. Now on the right hand side here, coming from kind of the cybersecurity track, especially on the incident response side, we've got deep technical expertise. So variance there from generalization. Um, you know, we are very clever sometimes to uh, our own detriment, right? You can see the IT crowd meme that I've got going on here. Um, we have the ability to go down and understand on a technical level what this means and whether it is something that we need to care about or it's something that we can put on the back burner. So, when you're looking at the combination of the two, the development of the discipline here that we call cyber threat intelligence, you end up with an amalgam. You get individuals who are really good at being able to present and adapt to their audiences, who are really effective at being able to understand the technical information being presented, add some contextual overlays, and be able to um, put that into terms in which the business or the stakeholders understand. Excuse me. So when we're thinking about how we can leverage cyber threat intelligence, there's a lot of different things we can do. Sometimes it's acting as that translation layer. It is being able to tell a compelling story, something that our more technical colleagues sometimes, you know, it's just not their strong suit. Um, we can leverage and contextualize information, understand the different motivations of different actor sets, understand the internal posture of the organization for how we can go about doing response or defensive efforts. Excuse me. And then also be able to help our stakeholders arrive at various conclusions, provide the intelligence support they need in order to run through that OODA loop in a much faster pace. So that leads us to this framework that I created um, on behalf of Mandiant. We published it in May. It's called the Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst Core Competencies. Uh, we did a lot of introspection we worked with industry, we worked with uh, internal folks to develop it. And the question that I asked when we started this is, I've seen this profession grow over time. What, based on today's standards, are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are needed to be effective in this particular job discipline? And what I arrived at is it depends because there is no singular um, job title or job role that can be defined here, but there are some common traits. There are some common traits that are shared that we can work to growing towards. So at a high level, the framework actually helps solve three different problems. You can see here today, I'm talking about one specific subset of them. And that one in particular is understanding what we do, like what what what's expected, like 
who, who we are, what our skills are, to understand how we can better leverage one another, either through uh, response efforts, got an ongoing investigation, or we've got an alert that pops. How can you help me? Have we seen this before? What are the questions you can ask? What are the skills that are there? So when we're thinking about the framework itself, I've broken it out into four different pillars. Those pillars are listed at the top here, problem solving, personal effectiveness, technical literacy, and cyber threat proficiency. Under each of those, there's three different competencies. I won't read them all, um, but I will point out that this is the way we've kind of broken it down in the framework itself. Um, this was not just a me initiative. I happened to lead it and then I went to some trusted soundboards and then I released it a uh, little more broadly. So in a way, what I was trying to do is create something that ends up being kind of like the MITRE ATT&CK framework, a full enumeration of all of the different things that we could be asked to do in a overarching mental model that allows me to characterize and define it. Now, on the left-hand side, the problem solving and personal effectiveness, these are things we kind of already have. We can work towards, right? These are encompassing of our thought process, our abilities, our innate thoughts, um, our social skills, our self-awareness. The other two on the right-hand side can be learned over time. So technical literacy, where cyber threat intelligence tend to shine and stand out usually more so than some of our peers, is understanding the, th the cyber threat concepts. So this tends to be our bread and butter. So I will spend a lot of time talking about that as I walk you through what each of these entails in the next few slides. I don't expect you to read all of this. I've included it here just as a quick breakdown, right? Problem solving has three overarching uh, competencies, critical thinking, research and analysis, and the investigative mindset. At the end of the day, you need to be passionate. To be effective in this field, you need to have natural curiosity and passion. That's often how I've referred to it. Um, the ability to kind of arrive at right conclusions, understand when we're going down pathways that are wrong or somehow inherently biased. You know, understand that we might not have all of the right information, but we know the data sets are the tools to go to where we can start to do enrichment and enumeration, and then how we can actually piece all of that together. Understanding the utility and limitations of various different indicators of compromise, um, knowing the mental models that exist, knowing the data sets. And then really, uh, you know, I think a lot of you naturally have this, and I saw it come out in the last presentation too, investigative mindset. Right. How do I know where to go next? How do I understand where I should be poking around? That's just, that's the passion part. That's solving the problem. And a lot of the, the best CTI analysts that I've come across have that natural curiosity. In a way, we're kind of like trying to be Sherlock Holmes. It's not very different than incident responders, trying to figure out where we go next. What's the next thing we need to do? constantly asking that question of why, why, why. If you didn't want to read all that, I kind of broke it down here. This is just a quick summary. It allows you to understand what we were trying to convey, why logic and reasoning considers needs um, for various stakeholders, various entities, understands unique fingerprints, can mine, interpret, store data, pivot on things, and then really devise novel solutions based on all of this. So if there's not already an existing solution in place, we can create one. And sometimes that's a framework. Sometimes it's a data schema. Um, it all depends based on what we're working on. It really helps us get to the answering the questions of our stakeholders of what we actually need to do to be effective. As we move to the next pillar, We've got personal effectiveness. Now it's interesting. I was working with our HR component and our learning and development component, kind of talking to them about this. I just wanted to, you know, as we were creating it, socialize the idea. And uh, the feedback I got was, 
yeah, you've kind of taken like the high level fluffiness of soft skills and actually made it applicable to your field. Um, which in a way was kind of a backhanded compliment, but I laughed and really took it as a positive not at uh, that this is something of the sort. When we're thinking about personal effectiveness, there's three different competencies that I felt were important. Communication, teamwork and emotional intelligence and business acumen. The last one I'm going to hit on quite a bit because it's something that gets lost so often in CTI. We get so caught up in the tactical day to day, we sometimes lose sight of the big picture. Communication though, comes in a few different forms. If I cannot communicate with you as my stakeholder in a way that's effective, that resonates, then what I'm doing is going to have minimal impact. And at the end of the day, as a service entity, my goal is to have maximal impact. So I need to understand you. I need to understand what you do. I need to understand who you are. Uh, sounds kind of a little creepy as I say it out loud here, but it's really important. I need to understand your job role. And hopefully, based on this, you can understand like the CTI function itself too. What we then do is, you know, when we're writing our research up in different reports or in presentations, we could tailor it. Right? The common operating picture, the common frame of reference ends up being a really good framework to use. So if I'm talking to a risk professional, I will use terms they know. I'm talking to a senior executive, put it in context of impact. What is the risk to the organization? How much could this cost? Things that they will naturally gravitate towards and hone in on. The ability to adapt communication style is particularly important uh, for various analysts. And you'll find that the more seasoned they get, uh, the longer they've kind of lived in this field, the more experience they have in adapting. In adapting to various different audiences, it's, you know. Back in the day, analysts tended to just write reports. Let me let me do research and let me write. Um, that has kind of changed. And even when I was at the agency, we noticed that there was kind of a shift in personality types for people who were um, driven to this profession. So. Teamwork and emotional intelligence is, I think, kind of critically important to understanding how to be an effective worker, how to be effective in the larger construct, understanding the interplay between vulnerability management, um, the incident response team, um, us, what we do, risk, critically important. Critically important, and that kind of falls under this business acumen category. And likewise, emotional intelligence really speaks to your ability to be self aware, socially aware, and maintain self control. Um, not everybody will be perfect on every single one of these competencies. And that's kind of a big takeaway, too. When we're thinking about evaluating the organization's needs. When we're thinking about bringing people in at various different levels, whether it's more junior level or more senior level, we'll want to identify where they should be on the spectrum. And we all have strengths and weaknesses. So some people are going to be stronger than others across these various different uh, competencies. And this is just kind of a quick summary. Uh, understanding how we share information, whether we need to put it into a more tactical uh, format that our security controls can understand or whether our humans are going to be reading it like yourselves. Understanding how to engage, when to engage, how to navigate conflict, how to resolve conflict, um, and then really aligning everything to the overall organization's missions and goals is kind of critical there. So um, one of the things that I point out, particularly in this last bullet point is understanding specific systems that are used by the organization. <laughs> so if you're operating, so to be effective as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, there's a few things that I think you need. One of which is to understand like core dependencies, threat modeling, being able to uh, understand systems. So in this particular case, 
I'm an analyst working in the financial sector, it's not sufficient for me just to understand IT architecture and security. I need to also understand the fintech side of things too, which is very unique, which is a very niche focus. Same thing with telecommunications. I need to understand the cellular technology behind it, what goes into SS7, how those systems actually work in process. Um, and as we are growing the field, we not just only have folks coming from information security backgrounds, we actually have folks coming from uh, kind of the more social science -y backgrounds too. So putting this together and uh, laying it out in a way where they can understand what they need to uh, focus on helps create growth pathways. All right, what probably resonates the most with you guys is technical literacy. And boy, is there a lot in here. There's enterprise IT networks, there's cybersecurity ecosystem, and then roles and responsibilities. Holy cow, this field has grown a lot in the last 15 years, um, in the last 10 years, really. Um, and likewise, we need to consider the implications of that. So for our analysts who kind of grew up in the field, we were fortunate in that our knowledge growth was incremental. For newer analysts who are just joining now, there's a lot to take in. There's a lot to take in. So, understanding the way systems are architected, understanding the way networks are architected, some of the design decisions behind it. That would, and what it means to move to a you know full or partial hybrid solution where you're on-prem, off-prem, or uh, not. All things that need to be considered because when we're looking at this from the context of the adversary, the attack surface varies and different adversary groups will focus on different techniques based on the environment that they're in. And likewise, understanding what actually exists as part of cybersecurity. Now again, if you're looking at those two tracks, traditional intelligence analysts or cybersecurity professionals who kind of come into this, the latter they kind of know this, we grew up with this. We understand the NIST cybersecurity framework. We understand what it actually breaks down to, but there's still barriers of entry for those coming in on the other side. Those who are really good at the critical thinking, who are really good at communicating and presenting, but have not perhaps focused on cyber. You know, they're trying to grapple with it and get their head around it so that they can be proficient and effective. So, um, um, and likewise, Right. As we've seen the growth of this field, we've seen various different roles and terminology come up. We've seen um, various different concepts kind of arise. Just understanding where everything interplays inside of that helps understand our ability to communicate uh, effectively with you, to work with you. Um, and the converse can be said too. One area I did want to touch on, though, uh, before we move on to the cyber threat proficiencies, is this the notion of SLAs and RACI matrices. It wasn't until a few years ago that I was actually introduced to them, and holy cow, those are critically important to know. Now, I had been doing it, I just didn't know that there was a formal name for those. Um, so as we're thinking through, how we can best support. A lot of it comes down to understanding, okay, what what does support look like? Really kind of unpacking and dissecting it. Racy matrices, especially on the analytics side, are huge. So who is going to be the action arm? Who's going to be responsible? Who's going to be informed? With a client that I'm working with right now, I actually created a modified racy matrix for their team. Um, so that they can work better across incident response, SOC, vulnerability management, uh, enterprise protection, and risk. I created a modified RACI matrix for them so that they can understand their stakeholder needs, how they best consume information based on what they're producing and how they're producing it, what the right conduit is and what the right workflow kicks off, uh, what will kick off the right workflow and when they need it. So this gets back to, uh, from the Intel side, 
just us understanding those intelligence requirements. Um, you know what the prioritization level is. And this is our bread and butter cyber threat proficiencies. Drivers of offensive operations, threat concepts and frameworks and threat actors and TTPs. You'll find that inside of this framework that we put out, it's I think nine pages, a good like two and a half or three pages is just dedicated to this. This whole area, uh, this breakdown under and it ranges the gamut. Understanding actors, understanding actor groups, understanding nation state programs or criminal programs, the composition of them, um, or concepts like attribution. When does it matter? Why does it matter? Um, does it even matter? Uh, what does it mean that they might have a multi-stage uh, piece of malware that they're using module malware or uh, various different exploit chains all kind of pulled together? Being able to understand this is, I think, the bread and butter of the profession itself, the bread and butter of what we have to offer, because we take a little bit of what you all are doing and we try and and then apply it. We take the information about the adversaries and how they go about conducting their operations, uh, dummy credentials, pass the hashtags, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we can contextualize it. Oh, here's our top threat actors that we tend to see in the environment. Here's the top threat actors that, you know, based on the landscape of the industry profile, we are likely to encounter. Here's the commonality. Now we can test our security controls against it. All of that is predicated on prioritization and understanding, under knowing that there are finite resources available inside of the organization itself. So I've broken it out again into kind of this summary chart here. And I'll walk through just a few of those examples in a second. I'll just pause and you know, let you kind of digest what that summary looks like. of the areas that I'll hit on before we move on to the next uh, slide is this concept of understanding what frameworks exist. Really, it's not so much what frameworks exist, it's what frameworks exist, why they exist, what problem did they help us overcome if we're still using them today? There has to be a good reason why we're still using it. And how can I apply it? What are the tools in my toolkit that I can then use um, and how can I use them? MITRE ATT&CK is the most ubiquitous of those frameworks that exists. Uh, it is you know, integrated into security detection products. It is also a quick and easy way for us to have a standard lexicon. But there are others. Right? There are things like the diamond model of attribution of intrusion analysis. Um, um, there are uh, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. There are several other frameworks that we use that all serve various purposes to help us understand and characterize and define the threat groups that we care about. So at a high level, right, our analyst should be able to tell you, for instance, what's the motivation, right? Cyber is used, cyber operations are used as an asymmetric tool when we're thinking about this from a nation state perspective. Uh, the ability to conduct operations over the internet offers some anonymity. There are more things we can do to improve operational security, but when we're thinking about this from a motivation perspective, there's really just a handful of those motivators that exist. We're looking at it from an espionage perspective. The analyst should be able to tell you, well, there's economic benefit, political benefit, military benefit. There are reasons why groups might do things like destructive attacks or employ destructive parts or even some anti-forensic techniques as part of their operations. They should be able to enumerate down to that level. Should be able to define the various roles and responsibilities in an offensive cyber program. So if I am a nation state actor, chances are I am working as a team 
in order to develop capabilities and conduct operations. This is probably something that most of us on the tactitioner side in cybersecurity haven't really thought about. It's just, oh, well, there's intrusion activity. We need to do something about it. Okay, well, let's unpack that a little bit. An intrusion activity is a tool or it's a technique being used. How many techniques does a group have? What does their composition look like? When we're thinking about this, and again, this, I'm harping back a little to my experience in the government. What's the overall capability or resilience of a cyber operations program if they keep getting detected or if we you know, find ways to impose pain upon them? Well, that's predicated on the composition. It's predicated on the availability of things like, um, and it really ends up being an interesting discussion about, okay, does that attribution matter and who are we attributing to or when and how? All things of that fall into this ilk. I haven't found a great diagram that exists to kind of describe the lay of the land for a cyber operation. So I made one. Um, when we're thinking about adversary operations, Naturally, there's this concept of you know, the hacker, the bad guy, the attacker. Well, they're doing things. They're using gray space. They're using middleware infrastructure, and they ultimately land on their targets. What does that actually look like, and what can they do to make things harder or more difficult to detect? This ends up being something that you'll find that the analysts will do. Right? We will take things, right, complex concepts, detections we're seeing in the organization, and we will find effective ways to present it. So I created this to show one of my clients, okay, as we're thinking about adversary operations, this is really what it boils down to. This is a framework unto itself. This is a mental model that leads itself to discussion. I can identify all of the different hosting providers. I can identify all of the different um, operation security measures that they do, the cutouts, the rings, um, what servers are being used for XFIL versus what servers are being used for remote command and control. I could show that. And when we're trying to take our data and present it to senior executives, having somebody who can take something and make kind of a brilliant picture like this tends to be incredibly effective because it's a conversation starter. So I use this with a client and I think we spent 30 minutes talking through all the intricacies of adversary operations working with their incident response team, asking about okay, how many points of presence do you usually see an adversary have for footholds on the network or beachheads on the network versus you know how many systems are usually used for staging. It ends up being kind of a good conversation started there, but these again are all things that your analysts should be able to do. I've just given you kind of an enumeration here, a list of the various frameworks, nothing uh, that I've seen like this exists yet. Um, and I'll, I'll use this as a chance to kind of wrap up, realizing we're coming up at the time limit pretty quickly. Unicorns exist, but they're rare. You will have analysts who are technically steeped. You will have analysts who are very good at the strategic side of things. You'll have some who uh, have a preference in tracking adversary operations across um, and working with various teams and stakeholders. Understanding where strengths and weaknesses are is critical. Uh, not ascribing a particular generalization to a team or individuals is also kind of important too. I realized that our day-to-day -day operations that we have tend to be in such a pace, such a tempo where it's really hard to sometimes be able to take a take a step back and say, okay, just because this analyst, um, you know, might not be super strong here, doesn't mean that their colleague is, uh, or they're they're not good at this. They can't support me, so let me not use them, or let me not try and use them. I'd ask that you give us a chance. Um, you'll find that there's variance when right? we're thinking about team composition, even in your own teams. There are strengths and weaknesses that exist. By design, team composition tends to be a composite. We are strong collectively together, and ideally, 
your analyst should be humble enough to acknowledge where they're not strong and point you in the direction to somebody who is. Unfortunately, there's no standard role, right? When we think about things like strategic threat analysts, we can kind of intuit what that means versus a technical analyst versus an intelligence engineer or a, you know, somebody who's kind of doing behind the scenes data schema work for us and creating tools that are going to help support our mission. Know that there are uh, unspoken rules on both sides and unspoken expectations there. So likewise, uh, I'm going to be making assumptions about what I think you do if you've not necessarily told me specifically. That's usually a recipe for disaster. Um, <coughs> CTI teams can always be seeking out feedback. Those feedback loops help us improve our ability to support. Likewise, be proactive about it. If you take the time and you actually meet regularly or occasionally with the CTI teams and walk them through your workflow, walk them through what a day in your life looks like, they will be way more effective at helping you. Um, I've been fortunate in my career to have worked incident response, to have worked digital forensics, to have worked strategic cyber program stuff, to work policy stuff. So I can flex across all those topics. I can use the common language. I understand the type of decisions and use cases they're dealing with with regularity. That's not everybody. Actually, that's not most. So give them benefit of the doubt. The more you can, the more you can provide about your particular role responsibilities and how you conduct your operations, they could start tailoring towards it pretty quickly. One of the things that you'll find is in this field, there's no shortage of smart people and they want to help. Obviously, we're a service organization. We want to help you accomplish the collective goals better, faster, um, etc. So being able to provide that feedback, being able to provide that series of um, engagement and mentorship and guidance is critical on both sides so that we can have a common understanding. And as we think about, um, this is just a personal one here, as you think about engaging the CTI teams, understand that they have a lot of priorities much like you do. So be realistic about what your SLAs look like. Not everything could be a priority. But when you do say something is a priority, it needs to be a priority. So just think about that. And uh, that's all I've got here. So the last thing I'll close out with is, please don't be a Regina George. Uh, we can absolutely make Fetch happen. We can make it happen together collectively as a team. I've got my Twitter handle here. I've given you a link to the blog post that then links off to the actual framework itself. Um, if we have time and we've figured out the kind of Q&A setup, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we can push that to social media. Thanks, guys.